Chapter 32, February 22, 1943, Warsaw Ghetto. We entered the wild shortly after midnight, sneaking in near the cemeteries, a detail I noticed with a particularly grim scowl. German patrols still crossed our path, but they were on vehicles, making it easy to time our entrance. As awful as it ever was to enter an overcrowded ghetto full of starvation and disease, the wild was somehow worse. Building after building stood vacant, or at least that was the impression those in hiding wanted to give. Scavenged pieces of luggage lay open on the streets, as those who were herded from here had been forced to leave their belongings behind. Nothing edible remained, and certainly nothing with any monetary value, but I saw a photo album lying open on the snow, the pictures blurred from the moisture, and a nearby single hand-knitted baby's booty. These were someone's treasures, someone's memories, stories of someone's life, once. It was haunted here. Anyone could feel that. Death permeated the night air, carried on the wind like a vulture's hiss. I smelled the blood, bitter to my senses, and seemed to hear the echoes of despair from those who'd discovered their fallen loved ones on these streets. Esther gestured that we should move quietly, not out of concern for the soldiers, but because she didn't want to alarm anyone hiding here. Perhaps she remembered the way the women attacked her in loads for those potatoes. Eventually, Esther and I would have to discuss her deception. I understood why she had wanted to know what had happened to those thousands of people, many of whom must have been her friends or acquaintances. But she couldn't ask for my trust one moment and then betray it the next. She, and she'd need time to properly mourn for her family. But not yet. Not while we needed to focus on getting through the wild. We crept up a rickety staircase to the second floor of a building. Even in the darkness of night, Esther moved with confidence, secure in each step. <clears throat> From her lithe movements, I was sure she'd been here before, likely had traveled this very hallway before. For all I knew, this apartment was once hers or had belonged to a close friend. <clears throat> she raised a finger to her lips again and then pointed to a closed door on our left. Listening carefully, I could hear movement inside the room. Someone was awake and aware of our presence, probably slipping inside a hidden compartment. slipping inside a hidden compartment and terrified that we might be soldiers or looters or thieves. Hmm, this is a little frustrating here. I wanted to tell them not to be afraid that we were friends, but I didn't, I couldn't. Even more, I wanted to offer them some of the food Esther and I were carrying. We had enough to provide the people here in the wild another week or two of life but our supplies had to get to the resistance members. Their lives were no more valuable, but their fight was. At the far end of the building, Esther knelt beside a framed and broken mirror hung on the wall. It looked nailed down, but the lower nails easily pulled free from the plaster walls, revealing a tunnel. Esther put her bag in first and then scooted after it. I followed, though I had to crawl on my elbows to fit through the small space, especially with the German pack still on my back and pushing the medical bag ahead of me. When the mirror rolled back into place behind us, the tunnel went black. I closed my eyes and listened for Esther ahead. For the first time since we met, she consoled me, quietly whispering that everything was okay. We emerged through a closet in a new apartment and probably an entirely new building, one that was closer to the new ghetto boundaries. Obviously, these above-ground passages had been designed to move people from one part of the ghetto to another without having to go onto the streets. It was brilliant. If I ever returned to courier work, I'd tell the other ghettos about this, too. <clears throat> Esther carefully peeked out a cracked open door of this apartment before declaring it safe to leave. Then we repeated the process before making the long walk to the far end of the building, entering this time through a hole that was disguised as a heating vent and exiting a new building through the cupboard beneath the kitchen sink. Yet this time, as we tiptoed through the dark apartment, I tripped and fell to my hands and knees. My breath caught in my throat. When the object I trip, tripped over sat, out, sat up and let out a small cry. Not an object at all. It was a child, 
a little girl with wide eyes and dark hair in need of combing. She grabbed her blanket and backed into the corner, clearly terrified and looking like she was about to scream. We couldn't have that. It's all right, Esther said, quiet, quietly said, then slowly crouched down to the girl's level. She offered a smile and smoothed her hand over the girl's hair. We're your friends. I followed her lead, speaking as softly and kindly as I would have spoken to my own sister. Are you hungry? For her, I could spare a little food. I gave her some of the German army rations we'd taken from the tank and an entire loaf of bread. If she was careful, it would last for some time. There was one more gift I wanted to offer her, the rest of the chocolate bar Esther and I had opened. I held it out and she cautiously took it. Sorry about that, folks. But her eyes flicked almost nonstop between me and Esther and the chocolate. Shh, Esther said, be safe. The girl remained in place until we left, although as, as soon as we closed the apartment door behind her, I heard the foil of the chocolate bar being torn off. I doubted she'd eat it all right away, maybe allow herself only a tiny piece. But I pictured a, a smile spreading across her face, and that warmed me. We crossed from this apartment safely into another, where Esther turned and said, This is our last crossing. After this next tunnel, we'll be inside the ghetto. It was so simple, I almost couldn't believe it. Why hasn't everyone left this? Why hasn't everyone left this way? I knew the question sounded naive, especially given all I'd seen as a courier, but I wanted to understand. It was one thing to have to be smuggled out of a ghetto. That could be expensive and required the help of a smuggler. But here, the people could get themselves out. Why? Esther shrugged. These tunnels were built by the resistance. Did your father know about them? Does the Judenrat know? Because if they did, then the Germans know too. I was involved with smuggling before I left, she said. My father didn't know that, nor about these tunnels. Obviously, the resistance had to keep this secret. Otherwise, word would spread, eventually someone would be caught, and then these passages would be shut down. But even most of those who do know about these tunnels haven't used them for escape. They'd need friends on the outside to have any hope of survival. And as you already know, the Jews have a short supply of friends in Poland these days. Yes, I knew that far too well. By now we had entered the final tunnel, a hole drilled through the shared brick wall of the neighboring building and hidden by a chest of drawers. We exited through a hole at the back of a mostly empty wardrobe and a deep sigh escaped from me. It was a relief to be out of the wild. Or perhaps it was a sigh of worry because we were officially inside the Warsaw ghetto and the clock was ticking. Esther suggested we wait until daylight before going out in the open. I'm sure the people here are extra watchful for strangers, she said as we sat in the corner of the abandoned room. You're a stranger and I'm the daughter of the Judenrat. I bundled my coat around me, blocking her out. Chaya, I said I'm... Good night, Esther. I wasn't ready to talk about that. Not yet. When the morning broke a few hours later, we slipped out of the, onto the streets. In appearance, it was similar to other ghettos, a place where seven people had to share every available room. The problem of such severe overcrowding had taken its toll on the streets and buildings. Most of the trees had been felled for their wood, and the ghetto walls were a constant reminder that this place was, and always had been, a kind of prison. Despite all that, I was immediately struck by how different the people of this ghetto were from any other I'd seen so far. No one wandered here. No one sat idly by, watching the world turn. Those who were on the streets moved with purpose. They knew what was coming, same as I did. They were preparing. Within only a few blocks, our presence was noticed. A hand tapped me on the shoulder, and the voice was sharp and accusatory. I don't know you girls. I turned to see a square-built man in his early 30s with a distinct scar on the side of his face. It looked recent. Forcing myself not to stare at it, I gestured at Esther. This is Esther Karolinski, and I'm Chaya Lindner. We're with Akiva from Krakow. We were sent here to help. Hmm. His expression remained cautious as he looked me over first, and then his eyes rested longer on Esther, and her shoulders hunched. 
She was looking anywhere but at him. I wondered how this man is affected by her father's lists. He nodded at our bags. What do you have there? We opened them for his inspection. He checked carefully through everything before looking up at us again, now with a wide smile on his face. Krakow, he asked. We heard the resistance there was crushed. Akiva is broken, that's true, I replied, but some of us remain and we want to fight here. His eyes returned to Esther. He must know who she was, or her father. He was suspicious of her, and I worried he might not allow us to remain. My name is Tamir, he said. I fight for Z.O.B. under the direction of Mordecai and Ilowitz, Esther finished. So will we, if you'll have us. Will we have you? <laughs> Tamir laughed, a surprisingly booming laugh. My dear, we would take a blind man with two minutes to live if he knew which way to point his weapon. Come with me. And so our morning began. This was one of the rare times when I was able to receive thanks for what I'd brought into the ghetto, and I wasn't prepared for the hugs and offerings of gratitude. We handed over everything, with one exception, my gun. I knew I'd need it, and I'd work too hard to give it up now. By the end of the day, we belonged to one of 22 ZOB units inside the ghetto and were given the assignment to dig bunkers. I didn't know how to dig a bunker. <clears throat> and other than Esther, I didn't know anyone else in my cell, but I was where I belonged, and I intended to learn as fast as I could. So when a shovel was put in my hands, I smiled and began to dig. Chapter 33, March 1, 1943, Warsaw Ghetto. After a week of working within the ghetto, Tamir found me again, asking if I would come speak to him and the other leaders of ZOB. What about Esther? She wasn't far from me, amid a pile of sticks, smuggled in from the forest. We'd been carving them into crude pikes, weapons that would take little more tra training than stab with the sharp end. The word passing through the bunkers was that our leaders expected face-to-face -face fighting with the Nazis. A sharpened stick wouldn't stop a bullet, but it was better than nothing, and we had plenty of nothing here already. Tamir eyed Esther and then said to me, we only need to speak with you. With a glance back and a shrug, I followed him from our half-constructed bunker down Mila Street to another larger bunker that served as the headquarters for ZOB's leadership. Mordecai wasn't here, nor had I met him yet, but as much as I would have relished the honor, I was sure he had far more important things demanding his attention. Instead, for this meeting, only one other person was here, a woman who introduced herself as Rachel. She had a pretty face with thick brows and a dark hair pulled into a bun and wore what appeared to be a mechanic's uniform. She belted it and created a holster at her side for a gun and I had no doubts about her aim. Tamir sat beside her and invited me to sit in a chair across from them. Their formality unnerved me. Was this a conversation or an interrogation? Rachel began. I'm told you were a courier for Akiva. I still am, I replied, though there isn't much of Akiva left anymore. She glanced over at Tamir then said, nor will there be much left of Z.O.B. after the Germans are through with us. I understand that. Why did she think I'd come all this way, risked everything I had left in the world? Tamir shifted the conversation. How old are you, Chaya? 16. Only four years younger than Mordecai and Ilowitz when the war began. Like your Akiva leaders, he had no military training, no real leadership experience, and yet we follow him. Do you know why? I shrugged. Rachel cut in. Mordecai escaped Poland at the beginning of the war and could have remained free, but he cared more about the youth he left behind. He cared more about helping us than about his own life. Now we fight for him, she leaned forward. Will you? We have one enemy, I said. So as far as I'm concerned, there's only one resistance and he leads it. Rachel smiled. You've been involved with the resistance for several months, correct? We've heard your name. We know your work. Why did Akiva fail in Krakow? What does it mean to fail? We never expected to defeat the Nazis, but we wanted to meet our deaths in an honorable way to bring attention to our cause from those who are strong enough to win. 
Yes, yes, that is true of all our resistance groups. Rachel was becoming impatient. But we want to know what lessons you learned from Akiva that we can use here. Help us avoid the same mistakes. Oh, I drew in another breath and began. We spent most of our time just trying to convince people of what was happening, both inside the ghettos and out. When we began to fight, it was too late. Tamir and Rachel exchanged looks. I thought of last fall's deportations in Warsaw, hundreds of thousands of Jews sent to their deaths on the trains. And I'd seen more of the ghetto now. Yes, there were many who were working and planning and preparing but they were doing it all for the thousands who remained, some too weak to offer any assistance, and others so broken that they welcomed their deaths. We needed more workers, more fighters, anyone who wanted to live enough so that they would die for it. But maybe it really was too late for all of them, for all of us. Before the Nazis could kill the Jews, they had to break us down. To save the Jews, we had to build them up again. Was that still possible here? I gestured around us. This headquarters for all the leadership, this is headquarters for all the leadership, correct? I think it's a mistake. We had only one bunker for our leaders, which made it easy for the Nazis to find them. And it's the only reason I'm still here. I had somewhere else to go. If this place is compromised, and sooner or later, it will be sooner or later, you must give people another place to go. The Germans believe taking out the leader's bunker is like removing the heart. Rachel nodded. Anything else? I shrugged. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. The fact is, we made many more mistakes than that. Most of us are young. None of us are trained to fight against an army such as this. And we're operating with few resources, limited movement, and a world that has almost entirely ignored what is happening to us. The only thing we really wanted to trigger other uprisings elsewhere in Poland never happened. It's happening here, as you hoped, Rachel tilted her head. Do you believe there's any chance of uprisings from the other ghettos? I shrugged again. Krakow won't fight back again, nor will Lodz. Though I'm sure there are people in both districts who would if they could, but I think there is hope for Bialystok, Sobibor, or Tarnow. And if we are very lucky, the Polish army will see what a handful of Jews can do with a small cache of weapons and less than a mouthful of bread. If we can fight, then they can too. <coughs> now Tamir and Rachel were smiling. Tamir said, where did you get this fire, Chaya? This desire to stand against Hitler's armies. <coughs> My cheeks warmed and I didn't know what to say. Was it fire within me? or foolishness. But the question evaporated when Rachel continued. What about your friend Esther? I know she looks timid, but she's stronger than people know. We do know her, Rachel. We do know her, Rachel said, or we knew her father. Esther must leave the ghetto for her own good. Other fighters won't risk their lives for her, nor will they trust her to help them. My fists tightened. Maybe an Esther and I hadn't fully resolved the issue of trust between us, but that was no reason to send her away. Esther is as much as part of the resistance as I am. It's not about her beliefs, only her background. A lot of people here lost family members, thanks to her father. And those same people need her help now, I looked at Tamir. You said we needed every person we can get. Not if that person gets in our way. We won't send her out on her own, of course. We're looking for a safe house that will accept a girl of her age and with her looks. That isn't easy, certainly not with tensions so high throughout Warsaw, but we are trying. We didn't want to surprise you, just in case she isn't here one day. I stood. You're wrong, both of you. Esther risked her life to come here to deliver a package. Did she give it to you yet? They looked at each other, confused. They had no idea what I was talking about. Did Esther lie about the package, too? I felt stupid. Uncommonly naive. Of course she lied. She couldn't have hidden any sort of package from the Nazis when they captured her. 
I wouldn't say any of that to Tamir and Rachel, though. Not until I found out what she was up to now. Instead, I said, Esther must stay. You've asked for my opinion about how to best carry out your fight. Well, it's my opinion that you need Esther here. She won't make the difference between a victory or a loss, but she will carry out her orders as well as anyone else or die trying. After a brief pause, Rachel said, thank you for that. We'll consider your words. We have one last thing to tell you, Tamir said, or rather to show you. There's someone who asked to be here when our meeting was finished. My brows pressed together as I tried to make sense of his vague words, but I turned when Rachel stood and opened the bunker door, mumbling, come in. It took me a moment to recognize the person who walked inside. He was older now, several centimeters taller, and clearly was fighting back tears. It was Yitchak, my brother. That's where we'll stop today.